Okay, I think we're live. Uh, this is Steve at Little Treasury Jewelers. I'd like to have a sound check, see if we're coming through loud and clear. And I uh, hope everybody's having a great day. Just got a little uh, You're Late from Craig message. So uh, I see Craig's available. Thank you. And Blue Shirt Buddha, you're first. Congratulations. And uh, Wags, all is well. Thank you so much. And it is going to be a really big show, Craig. And Carlos, uh, you're out for some okay around Spain, but you're in today, aren't you? And uh, uh -huh. a little nudge from Craig, need to get an accurate watch. Well, uh, I think you have our most accurate one, so uh, I rely on you to give me a little nudge when it's time. And uh, sound a little low, says Craig. I'll turn it up. Great. So um, today uh, we're going to do a first. I'm going to have a live guest Skyping in and uh, being a little late as usual with other things. I need to open up my Skype so we can receive our guest shortly. And um, today's topic is going to be uh, micro brand watches. And uh, we're going to focus on a particular brand and have a uh, bit of a discussion about what's going on in uh, micro brand and uh, actually what is a micro brand watch. A little, at little Treasury, we have a, a pretty good history of dealing with uh, niche brands, uh, brands where we're dealing with uh, directly with the owner, with the watchmaker, the people who make the watches. Uh, some of them are uh, making a hundred or less watches per year. Uh, it's always been our hallmark to uh, uh, include uh, these uh, somewhat quirky brands in some cases, the emerging brands, and uh, some come and go uh, and don't uh, stay active in the market. Uh, we've had uh, Bathus Hawaii, for some of the, you who might remember them, we did very well back in the aughts. Uh, with the brand uh, uh, from Hawaii, and uh, that now is uh, uh, semi-dormant, I think, or is actually withdrawn to the uh, the owner. Uh, we have smaller brands like Alexander Sharikov, uh, Schaumburg Watch, the German brand, uh, uh, Citizen Campanola, although it's a part of the, the largest watch company. Um, it was here briefly. Uh, and we were one of the few dealers. Uh, customers still ask about them. I think they may be coming back at some point. I saw them uh, last year at uh, Basel. Uh, Towson Watch Company, our local uh, watch company, uh, would be of that ilk. Uh, although it's been around since 2000, it's essentially run by two gentlemen, make very fine watches here in Maryland. And uh, we one of the uh, two or three dealers uh, in the country that uh, carry them. Uh, we used to carry uh, the original Anonimo, uh, for those of you that remember that brand. Uh, it's now been revived, but we uh, carried them back in the day, and uh, there were just a handful of dealers at the same at the time. Uh, we carried uh, Dodan watches, a French uh, military brand, and um, apparently not distributed anymore in the U.S. So. We're very familiar with uh, the characteristics of these uh, smaller brands, uh, maybe most of them a little bit bigger than what you call a micro brand. Um, and uh, uh, we're very fascinated by them. And uh, in many ways, they're sort of the engine of uh, uh, novelty in uh, the watch world. And uh, today, uh, we're going to uh, talk about a brand uh, called Orion. Uh, that is founded and run by Nick Harris. Disclosure, Nick is my grandnephew, but he came into watches from a different pathway. It does, has nothing to do with uh, uh, our being a watch dealer, and uh, he'll be coming in and uh, telling you about that. And uh, he's had a pretty good little week on his hands here, and let me see if I can bring up uh, what I want to show you. Um, here we go. And switching over. 
Okay, so earlier in the week, Hodinkee, I'm sure you all uh, know the site, sort of the, right now, the preeminent uh, watch discussion, review, uh, forum, portal, uh, what you will, and now retailer, I might add. Um, here's their page, and uh, we have uh, news on the George Daniels uh, watch selling for 4.6 million, something on the Omega, uh, uh, first Omega in space Met edition for the Metropolitan Museum of Art, something on Planck Pain, uh, 50 Fathoms, Breguet, uh, Patek Philippe, F.P. Jorn, Tudor, uh, Aldemar, uh, Porsche Cars, and uh, J.J. Lacoutre, and finally, Orion, and they have a large, uh, pretty much almost 100% complimentary review of uh, Orion's uh, main piece, The Calamity Diver, and uh, you might want to go take a look at that. I think it's uh, quite an amazing uh, tribute for a one-man show. I think I'm getting a call. Let me go over to Skype, and not yet. Uh, Got to keep my eye on it for uh, our call in. And let's return to that. So, not so easily done. Okay, here we are. So, um, as you can see, a lot of great photographs. Here we go. We're getting our call. Okay, hey Nick, hey, how are you? Uh, I'm good, gonna, are you good. I'm going to bring your uh, picture on and see if I can get that done. Here you go. And uh, you have your phone oriented vertically, don't you? Or you oh, should I go horizontal? Yeah, I think uh, our. Uber, now you got to change the orientation of the uh, phone itself, not the physical. The, oh, yeah. Yeah, I'm phone. sure you know how to do that uh, very quickly. <clears throat> Good. Okay. Let me and, see if I can flip this around. Yeah, and let me see if uh, there you are. I and so hopefully everybody can see. So how are you today? I'm doing well. How are you doing? Okay. You're still uh, basking in your... Uh, treatment by Hodinkee. We just were showing that to everybody. Oh, yeah. I had a few orders to come in today, so I did some assembly and then ran off to the post office, and now I'm back here. Uh, you're a little short in supply, I think, aren't you? Yeah, that's right. But, yep. um, I've got four of them here, by the few. way. Yeah, I do. So anyway, let's, uh, let's talk about you and uh, what you're up to. So... Um, First off, where's your company, where are you located, and what are you doing? And then we'll get on to looking at particular watches. Um, Ryan is my brand, and I'm currently located in the suburbs of Philadelphia. Um, yeah, I'm, I've been making watches. I started Orion, I guess, about three years ago. Mm -hmm. um, but I had my first model come out about two years ago, as there's like little lag time from design to production. Sure. And during that time, I went to watchmaking school, became a certified watchmaker, and uh, I've been working towards uh, you know American manufacturing and having my own service center, which right. you can see that bright light behind me is the light for my bench. Okay, great. And then uh, prior to all this, uh, you, what really got you into the watches? Um, I think there was an Omega somewhere in the mix, wasn't there? Right, I inherited a family heirloom, an old Omega Constellation from 1955, and it wasn't in working order. I thought to myself, you know, I need a new hobby. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm good with my hands. I think I'll look into watch repair. Right. And I started just, you know, searching everything I could on the internet, and one thing led to another. I started. Uh, modifying Seiko's as an affordable way to get into watches, and that kind of uh, gained me some popularity on the internet, and people started asking me to 
modify their Seikos or work on their watch. And, you know, one thing led to another. I started having my own parts produced, and then I figured, why not just have the entire watch produced? And I kind of uh, put my life on hold and jumped in to the deep end of the watch world you and sure horology. Have. And I know you worked like crazy when you were in watch school and uh, producing your... Uh, your watches, you pretty well funded a lot of your uh, education, didn't you, by uh, your uh, your business? Absolutely. Yeah. That, yeah, it uh, funded it totally. Um, since, you know, I had a bachelor's degree, I wasn't eligible for financial aid, so I had to pay for everything out of pocket. Right. But, um, yeah, it, it, was, it was a little tough at first, you know, running a brand and having a brand catch on. I think mm -hmm. any new brand is, uh, especially in the watch world, is met with kind of uh, – you know, this inherent distrust right at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So you kind of have to be patient and prove to yourself that you're not just like some other brand that's going to pull a fast one and disappear. But right. You know, but you've always had through school. You've gotten pretty good press along the way, too. And I guess it culminated with this um, Hodinkee thing. So that's great. So let's look at a couple of your watches. And uh, I'm going to switch um, to another screen and i don't know if that did that come up for can you see that right away or not uh, okay not yet so, yeah so we're looking at your uh first orion the uh the blue this in this case the blue and okay. can you maybe tell us and uh, the red i guess is sold out um and they were just called the orion blue the orion red or what was the uh, uh so those were called the orion one and then one, they had okay. the two different uh dial versions so the right. orion one blue had uh the blue text there and okay. then they also had um the blue tick marks on the minute track every five minutes and then the orion one red just had the red text at the bottom and a completely white minute track right I and see. that was the first model Okay, how did that um, do? Uh, it did well. It you know it was met with a lot of scrutiny at first, um, but by the time you know I announced the design, people loved to criticize it. And then mm -hmm. a year and a half later, I sold uh, you know all three hundred plus of them. That's great. And then so what's it, the size you know, of being... what's the size of that watch? Both the diameter and the thickness. That is a 38 millimeter watch. Mm -hmm. um, it's about 13 millimeters thick. It has a 49 millimeter lug to lug length. Um, it's kind of, it, it was influenced kind of by a lot of, uh, you know, dressier and vintage designs. Mm -hmm. I personally like vintage watches because I have small wrists, but what I don't like about them is that they're often very delicate and they're not, uh, great candidates for mm -hmm. everyday watches or uh, a watch for, you know, an active lifestyle. So right. I kind of infused those elements with, uh, you know, a tough case and modern manufacturing. And Someone bit... described it as an undercover field watch, which I think is a right and a big good descriptor for it. A big cr knurled crown to boot, right, with your signature on the end. Yeah, that quickly becoming a hallmark of the brand is very large crown. Mm-hmm. That's almost nine millimeters, and uh, you know like that's one of the you know main points of uh, interaction on a watch. And I think it should be something that's easy and not like frustrating or annoying. You know, right. And I'm I sure some some of you have picked at small crowns before. Right. And I see you have drilled lugs, making it easy for people to switch out the uh, straps. And uh, mm -hmm. very nice. Uh, that's great. So that's all gone now. Is that right? Yep, still... those are all gone. Yeah, okay. And, uh, but very comfortable on the wrist. And uh, I actually had, a, I have one left here. I have the blue and actually have a uh, sale in progress on that. So uh, that will be it, I think, won't it? Yeah. Yep. Okay. People knew you had some. I think they'd come and snatch them. Right. Well, uh, I think your recent press has uh, helped. So now I'm looking at... Uh, this is another piece I have here, which is the field standard in DLC. And so uh, tell us a little bit about that guy. Uh, so my first few watches, which would be the Orion one, the field standard and the self were all based off of the Orion one case. Uh, the field standard is 
based on a popular watch I did known, or it was a mod that I'd been doing. And uh, stylistically, the field standard is similar to it. But mm -hmm. when I was doing Seiko mods, I was constrained by uh, third party parts that were available to me. Right. So n with Orion, I was able to, you know, design my own parts and I kind of took my, uh, you know, my vision of the field standard and mm -hmm. applied some of uh, my own personal touches to it. Sure. So got a very traditional uh, field watch with the, you know, the cathedral hands mm -hmm. and kind of the high contrast seconds, but then you also have these faceted uh, markers every five minutes, beautiful applied indices that give it just a little bit of, you know, flash, but mm -hmm. nothing too overt. Right. Okay. So, uh... I'm uh, moving on now to the Calamity Blue, uh, which I have on the screen now, uh, shot of the dial. And this is the one that Hodinkee has reviewed. And what was in your mind when you put this one together? Um, so the Calamity, uh, that was kind of, I had to pull out, I wanted to pull out a lot of stops for this one. Um, I think the market is saturated with really thick and chunky dive watches. Uh, I think that's a, you know, a problem. I have small wrists, so I'm pretty sensitive mm -hmm. to chunky watches. Um, so I wanted a thin dive watch that was comfortable, but I also wanted it to have, you know, real dive watch water resistance. Um, and then continuing with, you know, the Orion design ethos of, you know, something that's and very much a tool watch, but also kind of has a little flair. You mm -hmm. have these applied indices and then polished bevels. So this is one of the thinnest 200 meter automatic dive watches on the market right now, uh, clocking in at 11.26 millimeters thick from mm -hmm. the case back to the top of the domed crystal. So it could be thinner if, you know, I wanted to sacrifice things like the domed crystal or the curved case back. Sure. Um, in order to make this possible, I went with the thinnest accessible movement, which would be the ETA 2892, mm -hmm. uh, which is commonly found in a lot of high grade Swiss and well now Swatch uh, watches, but you know previously mm -hmm. lots of brands used that movement. So this right. was meant to be kind of a very easy to wear but still serious dive watch that kind of confronted the issue of chunky dive watches taking over. Uh, the industry a sure. little bit and uh, I have a picture of the drab here also and uh, I read somewhere that's sort of an afterthought you sort of the trial balloon that uh, paid off right so um, I was working with Kyle who helps me with my designs and we we had uh, you know decided on a black and a blue version and on a whim I had said you know I want to see this in green but the drabest green you can do. And he's like, I don't know about that. I don't know about green. I was like, just pull the renders, let's see. And he did it. And I was like, oh, we, we need to do that. And it looked right. great. But the original designs, had the green was so drab, it was almost gray. But because mm -hmm. of what's, um, what you can achieve with ceramic and ceramic coloring, uh, we went with a little a little more green than the original almost gray color, right. which is what you see here. Great. So um, I am going to show a little video of your clasp. And uh, the uh, it's it's got a plastic wrap on it, so uh, folks don't get excited. It's not scratched and marred. It looks beautiful in life, but I'm trying to preserve its uh, original integrity for the uh, guy or gal who actually buys it. So um, just showing the clasp and uh, showing the dive extension, which is incorporated. So a lot of uh, interesting, uh, nice touches for watching this price point, which is, Nick? Oh, it's about, it's fourteen ninety five. Yeah, okay. And it does have micro adjustments and it, the clasp is signed with the Orion logo and uh, very nice. And, one thing I'm not showing uh, well is the um, very nice, thoughtful, uh, polished uh, edge to the bracelet, which is really nice. And I had a rep from one of our top brands in here yesterday and just happened to show him this. I told him I was doing a show 
and he immediately jumped on it. The, the nice features of the uh, polished uh, edges versus the uh, brushed and the finishing of the bracelet. So uh, he knows what he's doing and he immediately said that it's really well done. So good job on that. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's kind of nice because the polished bevel from the case flows into the polished edges of the bracelet. Sure. And then for a seamless look. Okay. So, um, and now I'm uh, showing an example of some of you've gone off on a few design excursions uh, in the process. And I'm showing the, mm -hmm. uh, the half dollar uh, watch, which I still have in stock here and ready for someone. I think it's a great 4th of July buy for somebody. And uh, tell us about that. Uh, uh, what, what's the inspiration for that? And uh, it's got some fabulous engraving on it as well. Sure. Uh, so the Orion One case was also designed um, with the intent of being a good platform for engraving. So it has, uh, you know, big flat surfaces. And at the time, I was working with a few engravers, and um, one of them had the idea of making a coin dial for me. He was also into coins, and I didn't stop him. So he sliced a few coins in half and kind of hammered them out to mm -hmm. diameter and then I you know modified them a little bit so they would fit perfectly mm -hmm. um, and it's just you know some people are into coins some people are into watches some people are into coins and watches mm -hmm. um, I think you know having a, a good creative kind of outlet is a you know good thing to do for people you're working with and, and that engraver and engraves guns I think right I, I think it's pretty cool that engraver does. Uh, yeah. uh, someone looked at this the other day and said, "Oh, that looks like a 357 Magnum." <laughs> not, <laughs> yeah, not, not sure that's so, where you were headed in your thinking, but uh, not really. No, but that, that I, was you the know, I love engraved pieces, yeah. and uh, it's a you know a really wonderful way to imbue a watch with some craftsmanship and personalization. Sure. So um, that is uh, pretty much it. The images. Uh, let's go back to. Uh, uh, so I'm going to try a split screen uh, if I can do this advanced uh, technology here, and at least for me. And there we are. Oh, I got to get me in here too. And there I am. And there you are. Okay. So um, in this whole process. Um, Let's talk about uh, who does all the designs. You do them all personally. Uh, uh, you, I worked mentioned... with Kyle, um, who's someone I was recommended to a few years ago, mm -hmm. and we we have a design process figured out in the beginning. It was kind of like me telling him what to do, but I very mm -hmm. quickly realized he was talented in his own right, and our you know design visions kind of uh, met in a, you know, pretty good spot. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, we go back and forth with designs. I try him. He makes good suggestions, you know, oh, and more often than not, those suggestions are a major feature of the watch design. So it's currently, it's both of us uh, working on these. And, um, yeah, we might take, you know, three to six months designing mm -hmm. a watch until we've got it all figured out and exactly how we right. like it. Okay, great. So what about the manufacturer? Is that uh, your, your sourcing things? Are you uh, so sourcing stock things? Are you uh, made to suit, uh, assembly, et cetera? What, what goes on there? Sure, almost everything is made to suit. Um, I use very few catalog parts. Uh, I mean, things like the clasp, uh, for example, on the Calamity was the only catalog part. Everything else was mm -hmm. made to design. Um, I kind of break apart my supply chains a little bit and I get um, have manufacturing done in Switzerland and in Asia. So kind of wherever just is the best match. Mm -hmm. I'm trying to do stuff here. So some of the more specialty parts, you know, engraving mm -hmm. or maybe specialty one-off dials might be made here. Um, so I kind of really try to use the global supply chain uh, as best as I can. But the ultimate goal is to, you know, have 
watches at all price points and to bring a lot more of that manufacturing back to the United States, at least for, you know, specialty watches to start with. Sure. So uh, tell us about what's going on with movements. It looks like uh, the Swatch Group is clamping down finally at, uh, at your level as well as at uh, the larger manufacturers. Uh, so what, how are you going to deal with that? Sure. So a few years ago, Swatch uh, and ETA, Swatch vis-a-vis ETA, said that they were going to uh, stop providing non-Swatch brands with movements. Uh, the Swiss government said, well, maybe you shouldn't do that so quickly. And, um, you know, a few years passed, nothing really happened. And then they started restricting flow to large brands. Mm-hmm. You know, we saw that we saw Tudor stop getting at a movements and is basically large volume accounts got shut down, but right. uh, smaller brands uh, like myself and micro brands could still get them. And then yeah. it was this year that they pulled all of their tech info and it looks like you know, supply lines are drying up. So I, I have a feeling this is uh, at the last year you'll be able to get at a movements. You may be able to get some, you know, from secret caches later on, but mm-hmm. other than that, it looks like uh, we're going to need to find new alternatives. Sure. And in terms of Swiss movements, you've got Salida, which have made their debut recently, and they used to do a lot of the assembly for ETA. So they have lots of experience there. Mm-hmm. As far as those movements go, they're pretty much one-to-one analogs of the ETA calibers. Um, so those are you know, proving to be a good alternative for the future. There sure. are good Japanese movements, Seiko, Miyota. Um, and then, you know, there are a few more Swiss uh, movement manufacturers. The Turna mm-hmm. uh, is another one. STP is out there. But uh, there's now an open niche for movement manufacturers to step into. Mm-hmm. And I think uh, we'll be discovering more in the next uh, year, next one to two years. I think it'll mm-hmm. be very real. Yeah, absolutely. So, okay, so you do most of the design. Somebody asks, um, uh, the Watch Lounge asks Kyle from Stratton or different Kyle. You can answer that if you want. Uh, it is not Kyle from Stratton. Yeah. He, yeah. Okay, somebody else. I don't else. know if he wants okay. me to yeah. publicize yeah, his Yeah, name. you can hang on to that, but I don't think it... Uh, okay, so um, what about marketing? How do you handle that? Uh, pretty much... And to, up until this point, I've done pretty well with social media, uh, word of mouth, and watch publications. Mm-hmm. So I send watches out for review. Uh, mm-hmm. I luckily have been uh, fortunate enough to, you know, have good relations with you know most of the big reviewers and been put in touch with other like uh, you know Gear Patrol, Worn and Wound, a blog to watch, and now Hodinkee and few others have all been you know generous enough to review my watches and i think you you had a good spread in the philadelphia inquirer didn't you a while back? yes uh early on they when i was doing the seiko modding they published me and that kind of Mm -hmm. came of left field and that was really Mm -hmm. good for a lot of the local uh awareness and then Mm -hmm. when i was in seattle um a lot of Seattle and the nearby uh, cities supported me. And I think a lot of that came from uh, social media. I think it's a pretty tech savvy city and they're all kind of keyed into local artisans. So the watchmaking school I went to was in Seattle and, uh, you know, Seattle locals really, really Mm -hmm. stepped up and supported me. That's great. So uh, I've read, uh, you have a pretty good, great website actually, which is, what's your website URL? Oh, Orion Watch. Okay, Ryan Watch, and you have a lot of blog content on there, both uh, uh, sort of philosophical and uh, practical advice for people, and really well written. So uh, I guess your liberal arts education uh, paid off as well. Now, really well written, so congratulations, and I uh, I know about that stuff, so uh, good job. Thank you. Yeah. yeah, I got a blog that's a lot of kind of my journey through watchmaking school and kind of, you know, some some perceptions on the industry. Right. It's a fun read if you're into that stuff. Yeah. So um, what about the the whole thing, um, the micro brand thing? Is, that, is this a, uh, 
phenomenon from uh, the internet. Uh, would this have been possible before uh, the internet to have this proliferation of how many? How many in this country? Probably hundreds, right? Of uh, yeah, micro brands. Yeah, the uh, like I was saying earlier, kind of access to global supply chains and the internet has really created like a platform for people to, you know, mm -hmm. start a company with a relatively small uh, overhead. Uh, it's still considerable work and considerable money, but it's, uh, I believe considerably less than it may have been before the advent of the internet. Mm -hmm. um, you know, looking back in time, there are certainly, certainly there's smaller brands, smaller obscure brands that would crop up and kind of disappear. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, that part of it isn't new, but, you know, the sheer number and volume and what's possible today, mm -hmm. um, that's, that's certainly due in part to the internet. Right. And then the customer base is largely in your uh, age category, millennial, if I may. Uh, personally, mine isn't. Um, it's probably the next two generations up mostly. Oh. Um, yeah, I do have, uh, I think I've kind of got the tail end of some millennials, kind of the older millennials mm -hmm. um, that are already, you know, well into their careers. A lot of entrepreneurs, people in uh, the tech industry. Uh, but I was also surprised when, you know, you've got, what is it, the... Uh, Gen Y and baby boomers also. Right. Okay. So uh, what's next? What, what, are you, what, you know, what are you working on? What, what should we look forward to in the next next year? Um, sure. I'm working on the Orion 2, mm -hmm. which I've got a, you know, a little prototype here. Um, yeah, focus. The a little, little choppy. Yeah. yeah. So the Orion 2 is obviously the successor to the Orion one, mm -hmm. um, that one, that watch will be super thin. I'm trying to aim for about a half millimeters thick. Mm -hmm. Um, should use the Salita 300, which is the Salita version of the 2892. So that one is in the works. Uh, so these first prototypes weren't, uh, quite, quite what I, uh, was after, but you can kind of see mm -hmm. where I'm going with it. Um, and should have a pretty fun tombstone bracelet, should be around $800 to $1,200. Mm -hmm. I'm also working on a pilot style watch called the Hellcat, and that okay. one will be in the more affordable range. That one should be about $600, 10 and a half millimeters thick. It'll have a curved case back and be pretty comfy. And if you like the aesthetic of the Calamity case, it'll essentially be a smooth bezel version of the Calamity with no crown guards. Okay. And good. that one will come in all sorts of fun colors. Hold, hold it a little um, bit still if you can. Uh, okay. Okay. Yeah. And but... this is um, a Calamity that I did a Rose engine turn to dial on. So I may be uh, doing some of that in the future, some mm -hmm. very specialty and handmade bespoke stuff. Uh, so that's pretty much what I've got going on. I've mm -hmm. also got my, uh, you know, blossoming service center happening. Mm -hmm. So I can, uh, you know, so, so uh, a lot of folks out here have, have watches. Uh, what, what kind of watches can you do a good job on? What do you want? Uh, you know, go uh, right now yourself. I'm, you know, trying to do kind of more simple stuff at a Rolex. Um, I'm not doing vintage chronographs. Um, obviously, I have a lot of other things on my plate. So the projects that might necessitate considerable attention and time, I'm mm -hmm. kind of passing on. But uh, at a no problem, most modern calibers, no problem. Mm -hmm. uh, Rolex, no problem. Great. You know, stuff like that. Okay, and then people can reach out to you on your website and uh, send watches in? Yeah, they can send me an email. Uh, right now, I'm mm. kind of keeping the servicing a little low-key just so I'm not inundated uh, with requests and volume, mm -hmm. uh, but certainly. Good. Okay, great. So uh, 
it's been, uh, let me see. Okay, here's a question from uh, RJ Lane. And uh, uh, is 904L steel readily available for micro brands or is that unique to Rolex? Sure, um, that is readily available. It's also a little bit contingent on the factory that you use. Uh, 904L steel needs entirely new tooling uh, when compared to 316L. So if you wanted to do something uh, in different, you know, steels, you would need entirely new molds and tooling uh, for the different material. But, uh, you know, it's a little more expensive. I mean, people could do it. I don't know why they don't. I've mm -hmm. been kind of thinking about it. Um, but, you yeah. Yeah. It is available. Okay. And Craig Shipp uh, comments, we need to get Nick a Cat6 cable for internet. <laughs> oh, yeah. 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 Uh, are you on wireless now or are you uh, wired? Uh, I'm plugged in, but... Not, not plugged in tight, huh? We'll um, see. <laughs> yeah, right. Okay. Yeah. So if there are no other questions, I'm going to let you sign off. This has been a lot of fun. And uh, you're doing great stuff, and congratulations. Great. Thanks so much for having me. Okay. You take care now. Okay. See ya. Yep. Okay. Um, that winds it up with Nick, and uh, we're getting pretty close to the end of uh, my agenda. Uh, I can uh, give you a little... Uh, tweak of what's going on here. Let me get my uh, thing queued up. So I, a couple of weeks ago, I told you we're on to something uh, new, a new brand here at the store, and we've just rolled it out. And I am trying to get to some photos and like to hear what you think. So. Here we go. Whoop. So we've just brought in uh, Zodiac watches, and uh, they're very pretty, uh, a neat brand. I'll be doing uh, a little something on them uh, in depth shortly on the history of the brand and where it stands today and take you on a tour through our collection and uh, i'm wearing this piece today the one with the uh, um, yellow uh, chapter ring and uh, the, the uh, super sea wolf extremely comfortable and nice and uh, a bit of a micro brand uh, but uh, owned uh, by a, a larger company that we can go into in detail, but uh, actually founded uh, one year after Grand Seiko, 1882, and it's had a bit of a checkered history, uh, especially in the aughts of this century, and uh, um, now owned by the Fossil Group in a very responsible way, uh, in my opinion, and very thinly distributed here in the U.S., and we feel uh, very fortunate to be able to bring the brand on. So um, that's uh, one of the things happening here at Little Treasury. So I uh, need to get back to our page to see what's going on. I navigated away, and now I can't see your questions. So. Here we are, and okay, so Zodiac, or pretty cool watch, had a Super C Wolf 53 and a bit ago, uh, cool to it out, not sure what that means, and uh, how thick are they, well I'm going to uh, put a measure, they are not thick at all, and I'm going to measure this Super C Wolf. So the one with the uh, orange chapter ring uh, that I have on is 40.2 by my measurement in diameter. 
and 14, 13.9 uh, with my measurement tool, and Craig always tells me it's uh, I'm not accurate, so uh, I will publish those numbers shortly. And I think we've just rolled this up on our website also. So let's see. So here's this uh, Super Sea Wolf uh, with a really, really nice uh, thin uh, rubber strap. And the watch itself, uh, although it was 13 something, actually feels and wears very thin. And nice case back with the Zodiac symbol on the back. And uh, the way the strap is constructed, uh, it keeps a lot of the rubber off the wrist, as you can see. So it's uh, very well ventilated. Uh, really nice design. So we're excited to have this brand. And uh, it is uh, definitely niche, as we like to specialize in. And... Uh, I will be showing you more, and you can see them on our website. I hope today uh, Cameron, our web guy, is working on them actively. And I have one more piece to show you. It's not, uh, not that. And let me just cut over to here. And just got this in. And... Okay. So, looking forward to uh, the uh, Apollo 11 watch. This is the Apollo 8 uh, moon watch, and uh, I think there are not a huge number of these around. Just got it in uh, yesterday, actually. And um, beautiful texturing of the moon's surface and sort of semi-skeletonized. Uh, and just thought I'd uh, wind it up with a look at uh, this piece from our Omega collection. And I'd like to know what you think of that. So, okay, so... Uh, uh, Craig uh, mentions Orion is the thin solution. Okay, definitely it is. So, uh, yeah, we love the Orions, and I've, as I said, I've got four of those uh, calamities here in stock for those of you who want the, the thin watch. And Thomas Burnett, I like dive watches with orange minute hands, like the Doxa subs and uh, the Ploprof. Uh, Craig, focus. I think my watch is focused. That's about as focused as you're going to get. So it's only nice to have Craig on the other end, keeping me straight. Okay, it's okay, nice. Uh, the very nice Omega, a bit large for him personally. Okay. So um, any other comments or questions? Uh, if not, uh, I probably will uh, get wrapping this up. And uh, enjoyed having everybody here. And uh, going to be back on pretty shortly uh, with a couple of other things I have in mind and uh, bringing in some outside people again, which I think uh, works, works pretty well. So with that, I am going to click the magic uh, beeper here and stop and complete the event, as Craig has taught me. I don't do that properly, usually. Okay, everybody, take care, and if I don't see you before the 4th, have a great 4th.